you may feel that it's going to fall on deaf ears. I hear that all the time in my community is that why should I speak up or why should I participate? Why should I get involved? It won't matter anyway. And so what we do in Bridges is we, you know, we have to dispel that myth, right? We come in and we show there's countless examples of how things have changed because of advocacy. Well, well you know, I was uh, looking to work with you on that project. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to Voices of World 7. I'm Deb Myers, and I'm Ruby Brewster, and we are here with Tish Atkins. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. So, we just want to just jump right in and just talk about who is Tish Atkins. Like, what do you do? Like, whatever short story you want to share, please just let us know, like, who who is Tish, Tish Atkins? <laughs> um, that's a great question. I am, uh, I consider myself to be, first and foremost, uh, a daughter um, a foster mom, um, uh, an advocate for my community, um, and just someone who, who shows up when she sees a need. Um, I am not a native Washingtonian, but I have been in Washington, D.C. a great majority of my life. I would come to Washington, D.C. at the age of 12, beginning at the age of 12, to work in my family's janitorial service. And it was during that time, during that exposure, coming to Washington, D.C. during the time it was deemed Chocolate City, mm -hmm. that I knew I had to be here. I mean, I saw people who looked like me in leadership roles, the mayor, you know, the, the elected officials. It was just an energy about uh, the District of Columbia that I knew I wanted to be a part of that. So I went on to um, uh, attend Hampton University, and immediately when I graduated, I knew I was coming to D.C., so I applied to two law schools. And both of them were here in D.C. And thankfully, I got accepted into one of them. And um, the rest is history. I've been a resident since 1994 when I came into um, George Washington University Legal Law School. So, Ooh, so Tish, you have a history. Well, tell us a little bit about how did you move around and, and become this policy person? I always knew that I wanted to be involved in, in politics in some way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, from a child, I wanted to be a lawyer. Just didn't know exactly, you know, what I wanted to do with that law degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I came into D.C., I interned at a lot of different places and eventually um, began my career working as the director of public policy at the D.C. Children's Trust Fund. And so I really began to see that, okay, policy is what actually influences everyday life. And so from there, you know, just moving on throughout my career, knew that policy was always at the forefront of um, how our lives are governed, right? Because of the laws, the policies that are in place that oftentimes dictate what we can and what we cannot do. Wow. And, and, and it seems like, Tish, we know you from the standpoint of Bridges, and that's the entrepreneurial side of Tish. And through Bridges, we, we get this advocacy piece where you're actually helping communities. Talk a little bit about how you've helped communities and how you develop policies for these communities. Well, um, again, just, you know, different, you know, your life, you know, the saying that we make plans and oftentimes God laughs at those plans, mm -hmm. right? Because he knows what the plans are that he has for our lives. So I would, you know, I had this plan of, you know, what I wanted to do with my life, but it just, you know, oftentimes I just happenstance to bump into a different career path or, or learning different skills. And one of those things, again, in working with policy and um, understanding that there was a disconnect, seeing the disconnect between oftentimes the policies that we make mm. um, and how they are intended to affect or, or, or um, provide an outcome for you know certain residents. Sometimes the disconnect is that it doesn't have that intended purpose, right? And so um, advocacy was that thing that I felt that bridged the gap, right? Because oftentimes when we advocate for those things that we know that are, are, you know, we want and we need for our communities, we as just ordinary residents, ordinary people can impact how policy is developed, how policy is shaped in our community. So again, advocacy being that missing link that oftentimes people don't get an opportunity to show up at and, 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 and strengthen their voice to advocate for those things that they want and need. Is, you know, is advocacy effective with policy change? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, advocacy, you know, anyone can be an advocate first and foremost, right? Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes our strongest advocates are those people who um, don't even consider themselves to be advocates, but 
they know that something's not right within their community. Okay. So oftentimes an advocate will, you know, those are the people fighting day in and day out on the front line for the necessary things that they want to see in their community. They just don't call themselves advocates because, again, you know, most folks don't walk around and say I'm an advocate, right? What they do, though, is they say that I, this is something I want in my community and I'm willing to fight for that, right? Okay. And so uh, Bridges, Building Bridges to Success actually was uh, formed to really help communities strengthen their voices mm -hmm. around advocacy and also to help them um, engage others in a shared vision for what it is they want to see in their community. Okay, example was that, I'm, I'm gonna go right in for it, is what you guys did in Deanwood. You, you, tell us a little bit about that Deanwood process. Um, I was a part of that, we met. We met at the Riverside Center. Um, people came together. You you brought folks together. Um, you had the one good element, which was food, but we came together to talk about just increasing the quality of life in our communities. But tell me a little bit more. What happened after that? Um, well, that was a, a project that I worked with with the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, along with the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. And so, um, you know, simply what it was is that uh, the government saw a need to, to, to work within a community to help them shape their voices, mm -hmm. help them shape their vision for the community. And through its partnership with uh, CNHED, we were able to come, come in and help to engage the community, bring the right stakeholders to the table, and make sure we had the right voices in the room, and then the conversations could begin, right? Because oftentimes, you know, government has to do its job. Mm -hmm. Sometimes government just doesn't know who they need to be engaging with. So it's organizations like Bridges that are on the front line, working with the stakeholders, working with the leaders, and are able to identify the folks that need to be a part of the conversation first and foremost. And so out of that process was a, um, we were able to develop somewhat of a roadmap to mm -hmm. what um, this, this entire, I guess, um, Deve community development plan would look like for the Deanwood community. And so um, I actually ended up leaving <laughs> um, in the in mid process, but I do understand that as a result of those conversations, um, this roadmap was developed and um, next step would be getting the people to advocate for the funding and the dollars to help implement the roadmap. Wow. You know what? And right now we're in budget season or we're in, I won't say, I, I guess we are. It is budget yes, season. It is budget, budget season. season. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and that plays a very important role in seeing what or who is going to get funded to do what. what? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, I remember the, the students you worked with in Benning Terrace one time um, trying to get them to talk about public safety. I don't know if this is a, a precursor, but if we think about safety now, we have the Safe Passage Program. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, tell us a little bit about what happened in uh, um, Benny Terrace <laughs> about four or five years ago. Well, well, you know, I was uh, lucky to work with you on that project. <laughs> 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 um, you and East River Family Strengthening Collaborative and the youth of Benning Terrace, right? We, you know, again, oftentimes when we think about developing policy, we just don't engage the right people. Exactly. Who better to engage around youth-related issues than youth, mm -hmm. right? And so we work with youth out of the Bidding Terrace community to really do the history because, you know, preventing violence just didn't start then. It had started years back, right? And so we wanted them to see what was accomplished through the hard work and effort of other folks so that they understood this was something that could be done, right? Mm -hmm. And so we you know, brought them together, they researched the history, and then they began to develop their vision for what it was that they wanted to see happen in their community. And from there, we skilled them up, um, gave them the tools and the resources to be able to advocate, and they went down to city council and they did just that. We had meetings with some, you know, higher, some high level uh, deputy mayors at the time, um, that these youth were able to capture their ears, right? Just because they took the time to really, you know, lay out what it was, what, what their vision was, and they went, went their way to make sure that that happened, right? And so we just provided the support. We just, you know, were, um, as you say, um, again, helping them to sharpen their skills, the skills which they already had. Mm. That's good. Yeah, and so um, in your presentation, you talk about the three, um, is it like the three 
terms of advocacy or the three P's of the advocacy. Three P, yes, the three, three P's, P's of advocacy. advocacy. Can you talk a can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. The three P's of advocacy um, participate, right? Okay. Everyone can participate. How do you participate? Simply by voting, right? Showing up to your uh, community meetings, right? Um, attending DC council hearings, and then um, that's petitioning, right? You petition your elected le leaders for the things that you want. You can do that by testifying at a hearing. You can do that by grant writing. You can, if you see a need and, and you, it lacks funding, you can write grants to meet that need, right? And so um, when you petition, you're, you're, again, this is how you get involved with um, the flow and ebb of government, right? Being, being present, just showing up, letting your elected officials know who you are and what your vision is and what your mission your mission is and what it is you want to see happen or not happen. And then there's um, protesting and peaceful assembly, right? Mm -hmm. And so a prime example of that is when, um, at the time, Mayor Gray um, went down with a few um, council members down to um, Capitol Hill, and they did, um, they, sat in, they sat in because they were um, actually wanting to get budget autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they did is they staged the sit in. They knew beforehand that they were going to do this peacefully, but they also knew that as a result, they were just going to be fined a $50 ticket, right? So you got to be strategic in your thinking, right? Think mm -hmm. about the civil rights movement mm -hmm. where folks staged the sit-ins, right? That's a form of peaceful assembly. You can protest. You can stop the flow of, uh, as I say, power concedes nothing without, um, without, without a, you know, without uh, a fight, right? And so sometimes you just gotta be strategic about which tactic you use to, to fight that fight, right? And so again, protesting, peaceful assembly is all about showing up and letting folks know that you're here. Um, and, you, and we saw that very well with the Black Lives Matter yeah. marches, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And how people just took to the streets to, um, to protest. Yeah. In some cases, peaceful protest, and in some cases, not so peaceful, mm -hmm. but it got the attention of, yeah. of the folks with power. Okay, and you know we're talking about advocacy. Why do you think um, just so many people like even when I was like younger, I was afraid to like advocate for something. Like, why do you think there's like this fear, or just like a lot of people not want to be part of the political process? I think most, mo you know, mostly because folks don't realize the power of their voice, mm. right? Um, you know, um, because when I've seen people. Um, understand the power of their voice. It's I often say it's it's hard to get them to stop, to stop talking, right, and to stop fighting for those yes. needs. But oftentimes we don't feel that what we have to say matters, mm. right? We don't feel that what we have to say is important, um, and we may feel that it's gonna fall on deaf ears. I hear that all the time in my community. Is that why should I speak up or why should I participate? Why should I get involved? It won't matter anyway. And so what we do at Bridges is we, we, you know, we help to dispel that myth, right? We come in and we show there's countless examples of how things have changed because of advocacy. Right now in March, Women's History Month, alone it took 143 years for white women to gain the right to vote through the women's suffrage mo movement. And so many leaders came and went, but the, the vision was still clear, and that's the right to vote for women, right? And so... Um, Again, you know, we know that change sometimes takes time, but you got to stay committed and you got to stay true to what it is you want to see happen because it will happen. Change will happen. And so we, what we do is we go in and we share with communities examples of how these changes have happened, either do the women's suffrage movement, Black Lives Matter, the civil rights movement. I mean, there's countless movements through history which show us that as long as you have a vision, as long as you have the tenacity, as long as you have the people to come together and fight for that, things can change. Wow. That's good. That's good. Things can change. Things can wow. change. <laughs> well, do you have any? I think I, I, I you you know, This was great. I want to say thank you so much for participating in this. We learned a lot, um, and we're just so thankful for all the work that you do in War 7. Uh, thank you for having me. And now we know who Letitia Atkins is. is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you.